Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 to 20 is our text. We are going to be looking at reconciliation. We started to look at it last week. We're reading from the New English Translation. If your brother sins, go and show him his fault when the two of you are alone. If he listens to you, you have regained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others with you so that at the testimony of two or three witnesses, every matter may be established. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. If he refuses to listen to the church, treat him like a Gentile or a tax collector. I tell you the truth, whatever you bind on earth will have been bound in heaven, and whatever you release on earth will have been released in heaven. Let me just say, we are not going to get to these verses this evening, but let me just say, verses 18, 19, and 20, which are often quoted by us and we quote it with some amount of fervor I want us to understand the context of the verses the context of these verses is how we work to reconcile each other and to exercise church discipline. Verse 19, again I tell you, if two of you on earth agree about whatever you ask, my Father in heaven will do it for you. For where two or three are assembled in my name, I am there among them. These verses have to do with church discipline and the reconciling of a brother. That is their primary context. Oh. Lord God, this is a difficult lesson to teach. And we approach it in fear and trembling because we know, Lord, that even Though we have to teach it, we are some distance removed from actualizing it in our own lives. And perhaps it is the same for those who will hear. And it is difficult to teach because it goes against the grain of the flesh, the natural man and of the opinion of the world. And there is more of the world in the church than there is of the church in the world. So help us this evening, Lord. We greatly need your help, and we cry out to you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. In our previous lesson, we briefly examined Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 to 24. In verses 23 to 24 of that passage, Jesus calls on the person who is the offender to take the initiative in the process of reconciling his or her brother or sister to himself or herself. In Matthew 18, 15 to 20, he urges the offender
did party to make the first move. As we noted last week, both parties, both parties have an obligation to work for resolution when there has been a conflict. There is in our society a prevailing culture of unhealthy tolerance for sin, which unfortunately has infiltrated the church. Many Christians believe that to judge any attitude or behavior as being sinful is to throw the first stone. They will misapply Jesus' statement in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 1. Do not judge so that you will not be judged to mean that believers should never disapprove of or correct the attitudes and actions of other believers. And we hear that. Don't judge me. The Bible says you mustn't judge. They perceive that if you if you speak to them about incorrect, sinful attitudes and actions that you don't love them. Because of this, many churches either accept or overlook gross violations of biblical commandments, especially as it relates to leaders. Some churches are very hard on the saints, but easy on the leaders. In his commentary on Matthew's Gospel, Stuart Weber provides the following excellent summary of the correct meaning of Jesus' words in Matthew 7.1. Do not judge others until you are prepared to be judged by the same standard. That's what Jesus was really saying. And then, when you exercise judgment toward others, do it with humility. When Jesus said, do not judge so that you will not be judged, he was not saying that believers are never to evaluate the attitude and actions of others. A closer look at the verse in its context will help us to understand and appreciate the real issue that our Lord wanted to address. The New English translation renders Matthew 7, 1 to 6 as follows. Do not judge so that you will not be judged. For by the standard you judge, you will be judged. And the measure you use will be the measure you receive. Why do you see the speck in your brother's eye, but fail to see the beam of wood in your own? Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye, while there is a beam in your own, you hypocrite? First, remove the beam from your own eye and then you can see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Look at verse 6. Do not give what is holy to dogs or throw your pearls before pigs. Otherwise, they will trample them under their feet and turn around and tear you to pieces. Now how 
will you know who are the dogs and who are the pigs if you don't evaluate and judge them? You have to judge. But judge others understanding that the same judgment is going to be used to judge you. Our Lord's teaching in this passage was primarily directed to believers, but the principle can be applied to anyone. Jesus does expect us to deal with this speck in our brother's or sister's eye in order to help him or her to get rid of it. He does expect us to do that. The purpose of judging someone else's sin is to help him or her to walk in victory. That's the purpose. Many professing Christians see church discipline as unloving. And many church leaders are afraid to practice it for fear of appearing merciless. Yet, refusing to apply church discipline in careful obedience to scripture. You notice I have those kind of highlighted in careful obedience to scripture. Not just arbitrary discipline, but discipline in careful obedience to scripture. Failure to apply church discipline is the most unloving and merciless thing the church can do. When the church does not deal with unrepentant people who have no shame or regret for their sinful attitudes and their actions, it either gives them the false assurance that they are in a state of salvation, or it causes them to become hardened and to persist in sin. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 12, Paul explicitly tells the believers in Corinth that they are to exercise judgment as it relates to each other. He says, for what do I have to do with judging those outside are you not to judge those inside he says I'm not called upon to judge people who are not saved we are called upon to judge those who are in the church but how can we judge someone else with accuracy if we ourselves are not free, before judging our erring brothers and sisters, we must first look honestly at our own lives and exercise the same judgment toward ourselves. When we do this, we judge others from a position of humility. A faithful servant of God will evaluate himself or herself as accurately as he or she ev evaluates others. He or she will be cognizant of his or her own innate sinfulness and need of God's mercy. So none of us who are passing judgment can do so from a position of perfection. He or she will therefore have no reason 
to consider himself or herself better than others. But we'll follow Paul's words to the Philippians. Instead of being motivated by selfish ambition or vanity, each of you should, in humility, be moved to treat one another as more important than yourself. Philippians chapter 2 verse 3, that's the New English translation. Brethren, maybe now I am judging incorrectly, but my judgment is that all of us have failed and are failing in that area. I don't think, well, I, I don't know of myself praying and not asking the Lord to forgive me of my pride and arrogance. And sometimes I just watch the interaction of persons and I know that we think of ourselves more highly than the person we are dealing with. Or we would never speak to them like that. We could never. But if we really understood our own sinfulness and our need for God's mercy, we could never think of ourselves more highly than we ought. Jesus requires believers to apply his teachings first, first to themselves and then to others. When God reveals his truth to us, whether in scripture or in some other way, our immediate response should be to say, how does this apply to me? How do I appropriate this truth to my own life? In following Jesus' command to refrain from judging, we avoid drawing conclusions that are superficial, proud, hypocritical, or self-righteous. Brothers and sisters, while church discipline is neither an easy nor pleasant exercise, the word of God clearly teaches its importance. And it is the word of God, not culture, which is the standard of faith and practice for believers. The Grace Workshop Ministry must increasingly become an assembly where the Word of God holds sway, where the Word of God always has the preeminence. It doesn't matter what you think or what I think. Your opinion and my opinion are absolutely irrelevant. What saith the Lord? What saith the scriptures? If there is disharmony with your view and the scriptures, with my view and the scriptures, we can go. Our opinion has to be set aside and we bow to the authority of Scripture. 
I hope all of us who are here this evening and those who are listening are committed to submitting to the authority of Scripture, even when it is painful to do so. Serious church theologians regard church disciplines as one of the marks of an authentic New Testament church. I am of the view that if a church is to be faithful to Scripture, it must practice biblical church discipline in respect of professing believers who persist in known sin. If the church fails in this regard, it is guilty of turning the grace of God into a license for evil. That's Jude 4. I told you that it's a very difficult lesson to teach, right? Difficult to teach and quite possibly difficult to hear. The verses and passages of Scripture set out here under clearly indicate that believers have the responsibility to exercise judgment in respect of their fellow believers. All the verses and passages reflect the rendering of the New English translation. John 7, 24. Do not judge according to external appearance, but judge with proper judgment. The Lord is saying that. What he's saying is we should not judge just based on what is external, just based on what we see or what we hear, but we must judge righteously. And we're going to come to that. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 to 3, and then verse verses 9 to 13. This is an actual case of judgment being rendered. Paul is writing, it is actually reported that sexual immorality exists among you. The kind of immorality that is not permitted even among the Gentiles so that someone is cohabiting with his father's wife. Paul is saying even the pagans look upon such a scenario as being totally out of place. Even raw born sinners, as old time people would say, find such behavior abhorrent. But it was happening in a church. It was happening in the church. You realize that worse sins can be committed in a church than even what is committed in the world. But here's the sad thing Paul says in verse 2, and you are proud. You are proud. Shouldn't you have been deeply sorrowful instead and remove the one who did this from among you? For even though I am absent physically I am present in spirit 
And I have already judged. The one who did this. Just as though I were present. Paul says. You are present. And you have done anything about it. And I am far away. And I have already judged. That something has to be done about this. So something is seriously wrong. With you in Corinth. Because you are right there. When you gather together in the name of our Lord Jesus. And I am with you in spirit along with the power of our Lord Jesus. Remember that I told you the context of that verse. Where two or three are gathered together. There am I. That it had to do with church discipline. Do you see it here, brethren? It's not a verse to be just quoted willy-nilly, you know. Oh, where two or three are gathered together. There am I in the midst to bless. Well, the Lord didn't even say I'm there in the midst to bless. And hear me. I'm not saying it can't be applied in other contexts. I am saying this is the primary context. Paul says, when you gather together, the next time you gather together in the name of our Lord Jesus, and I am with you in spirit, along with the power of our Lord Jesus, whatsoever you bind on earth will already be bound in heaven. This is the context. Hand this man over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Paul is still treating this man as a believer, you know. Even though his action is worse than a pagan, Paul is saying, my judgment is that this man be handed over to Satan so that his body will be destroyed. Because that is the only way that his spirit will be saved. Paul says, I have already judged. So when we glibly say the Lord says, judge not. Please understand the context. Let's go down to verse 9. It's the same context. Same context. I wrote you in my letter. So he has, he's talking about a previous letter. So what we have as 1 Corinthians is really not 1 Corinthians. There was a letter written to the Corinthian church by Paul that is no longer extant. It is extinct. I wrote you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. In no way did I mean the immoral people of this world or the greedy and swindlers and idolaters since you would then have to go out of the world. This is, remember earlier, where we quoted Paul as saying, I can't judge those outside. So he's saying, if I told you not to associate with sexually immoral people, I couldn't be talking about those who are in the world. Because you'd have to give up your job because you work with those kind of people. You live in the same community with those type of people. But now, I am writing to you not to associate with anyone who calls himself a Christian 
who is sexually immoral or greedy. Greedy, you know. Greedy or an idolater or verbally abusive or a drunkard or a swindler do not even eat with such a person. Church discipline, judging, Have you, have you gotten a little appreciation of what is the measuring rod that we should use to judge? Paul is not saying, he's not speaking here about a person who is overtaken in a fault. He's talking about a person who is living this way continually, yet claiming to be a Christian. He's not talking about somebody who falls into sin. He's talking about somebody who professes to be a Christian, but is living this way continually. All of us sin. See, the verse comes back for what do I have to do with judging those outside? Are you not to judge those inside? But God will judge those outside. Remove the evil person from among you. Remove the evil person from among you. Paul is talking about a child of God. Difficult lesson to teach. And I'm saying to us, brethren, that if we are to be a God-honoring church, this is how we are going to have to operate. Brother Nathan, you have a question? Can you wait until the end? All right. Thank you for your patience, Brother Nathan. First Corinthians 6, 1 to 6. When any one of you has a legal dispute with another, does he dare go to court before the unrighteous rather than before the saints? Or do you not know that the saints will do what? Judge the world. And if the world is to be judged by you, are you not competent to settle trivial suits? Do you not know that we will judge angels. Why not ordinary matters? We have a responsibility to judge. So, if you have ordinary lawsuits, do you appoint as judges those who have no standing in the church? I say this to your shame. Is there no one among you wise enough to settle disputes between fellow Christians. Instead, does a Christian sue a Christian and do this before unbelievers? First Corinthians fourteen twenty nine. Two or three prophets should speak and the others should evaluate what is said. Even the preachers are to be judged. I 
and for us to properly evaluate what is preached to us and what is taught to us. We must know the word. I want to say this to us. Some of us are fascinated by preachers and teachers who are teaching falsely. And brothers and sisters, one of the great negative effects of false doctrine is that over time, if you listen to false doctrine long enough, it impairs your ability to understand true doctrine. Some of you need to stop listening to some of the persons you are listening to. I say that in the fear of God. There's a little joke I tell sometimes of a pastor who said to one of the members of the church, a lady, he said to her, I notice that whenever I am preaching, you are sleeping. But whenever I bring a speaker from outside, you never sleep. And she said, Pastor, don't take it as anything negative. When you preach, we can sleep because we trust you. But them other man, we have to listen to them. In Matthew 18, 15 to 20, the reconciliation of believers is dealt with under the theme of church discipline. Still reconciliation, you know, but it is dealt with under the theme of church discipline. The scriptures outline five steps that are to be taken as it relates to the disciplining of a professing believer. We shall briefly consider these steps. We will only be able to consider step one this evening. Step one is a private meeting. Let's all say a private meeting. What is step one? What is step one, brethren? This Covering this step is going to show all of us how wrongly we have operated, including myself. If your brother sins, go and show him his fault when the two of you are alone. When the two of you are alone. If he listens to you, you have regained your brother. In the first place, 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 a believer who has a conflict with another believer is called to address the matter with the other person personally. If we have been offended by a brother or a sister 
or if we are aware that a brother or a sister is involved in sinful activity, we are to go and confront the individual directly. The scripture clearly states, go and show him his fault when the two of you are alone. Hmm. To act quietly and privately when confronting another believer concerning his or her offense is not less important than it would be if we were the one who had committed the offense and were being confronted. Because this is how we would want to be confronted. Am I right or wrong? Am I right or wrong? We must bear in mind that the person we are meeting with is a brother. Jesus says, if your brother sins, the person we are meeting with is a brother or a sister, a Delphos, one from the same womb, someone who is precious to the Lord and should be precious to us also. Let us remember the golden rule of our Lord recorded in Matthew 7, 12. In everything, in everything, treat others as you would want them to treat you. For this fulfills the law and the prophets. Brothers and sisters, do you see that Christianity is impossible to live unless we are filled by the Spirit of God? When matters are handled privately, misunderstandings can be addressed. And there is great potential for the other person to respond positively. In addition, a private meeting helps to avoid the problem of gossip that can occur when a matter is taken to others instead of to the person involved. But the flesh, the natural man, loves gossip. You don't have to say amen. Hear me, beloved. Our objective in meeting with the offending party is not to set him or her straight or to get things off our chest. By lecturing him or her about how wrong he or she is. Our aim is to get him or her to listen to us so as to win him or her back to the Lord. That's the attitude with which we should go. We're not going to settle a score. The best way of convincing someone of his or her sin is to take him or her to scripture. We said this already. Our opinion really doesn't matter. It is God's word that is the authority and must therefore be appealed to. 
Our attitude should reflect Paul's instruction in Galatians 6, 1 to 3. Brothers and sisters, if a person is discovered in something, you who are spiritual, restore such a person in a spirit of? In a spirit of? In a spirit of? Gentleness. David, in one of the Psalms, in one of his songs of praise, he writes, your gentleness has made me great. Pay close attention to yourselves so that you are not tempted to see what Paul is saying reflects what Jesus said. The same measure you meet is going to be measured to you to consider your own selves. You who are spiritual. Brethren, isn't it strange that when we are wrong, we want people to deal with us tenderly. But when others are wrong, we come to them and we are going to deal with them. You notice Paul says, you which are spiritual, Restoration is not for butchers. And there are too many butchers in the church. And there are butchers at the Grace Workshop Ministries too. A spiritual person is not a person who says, how could you let that happen to you? You don't know better than that. A spiritual person is one who understands that it could happen to me too. Carry one another's burdens. Carry one another's burdens. And in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something, when he is no thing, the word nothing is made up of two words. No and thing. No thing. He deceives himself. If you think that this couldn't happen to you, you are a fool. You are living in deceit. You are deceiving yourself. If you think you are bigger than the person who has sinned or better and you can't work with them to help in the restoration process, you think too much of yourself. I think too much of myself. Our Lord says that if we have been offended or have knowledge of a brother's or sister's sin, then we, not the pastor or anyone else, are the ones to go to him or her. To convince a person that he or she has erred is a difficult and delicate task. Our aim in confronting the offender should always be to restore him or her to God and to those he or she has wronged. That word restore in Galatians chapter 1 has to do with orthopedics. It is the idea in the Greek is the setting of bones that are out of joint so that the limb 
can function as it did before the injury occurred. Restoration. While we should pray before we go to confront our brother or sister, we should not call several persons to have them pray about the matter. That is usually just an excuse to spread gossip. All of us have been guilty of that. Of course, we may need to seek confidential counsel from mature believers, but we should limit it to two persons at the most. The offending brother or sister will probably be more likely to acknowledge his or her fault in a private setting than if he or she is approached initially by several persons. In a private meeting, the matter may be dealt with without anyone else ever having to know about it. It is important for us to acknowledge, however, that there are cases in which discipline should not begin with private admonition. Public sins should be dealt with publicly, as Paul shows us in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And Lord willing, we will deal with that next week. When we are going to confront a brother or a sister, we should ensure that we are properly apprised of the facts. Proverbs says, I think we mentioned this on Sunday, a fool answers a matter before he has heard it. It is only a fool who hears one side of a story and runs with it. Usually what happens to us is that the person who comes to us to offload is a good friend of ours. And sometimes we already have off the other person because it wouldn't be the first time that that person came to us. Brethren, you see, it is far easier to obey church rules and regulations and standards and sing and clap and get the glory than it is to live like this, you know. That's why you don't hear much teaching on these subjects. Because teachings like these are not popular. Don't just run with one side and go and confront somebody. If someone informs us about someone else's sin, we should instruct the informant to go directly to the offending person. Mm-mm. We should never confront anyone on the basis of hearsay or gossip unless we are going to ascertain the facts. We should confront lovingly. Lovingly. If the offending person knows that we genuinely love him or her, and care for him or her, he or she will be more likely to listen and respond in a godly manner. Brothers and sisters, we should not understand our Lord's instruction in verse 15 as a command 
to confront our brother or sister with every sin that they may commit against us. The sins that merit church discipline are flagrant sins that may destroy the peace and purity of the body of Christ. Discipline is not to be enacted for every grievance that arises in the church. There are some things that we can overlook and take to the Lord in prayer. The Bible says that we should bear with one another and be long-suffering toward each other. 1 Peter 4, 8 speaks of the love that covers a multitude of sins. Yet clearly, there are some things that we cannot suffer for long without addressing them. Something just came to my mind. I hope that I can find it. Ecclesiastes chapter 7, uh, media team, I'd like to ask you to find Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verses 21 and 22 in the message version for me. Ecclesiastes chapter 7, 21 and 22, I'm reading from the King James Version. Also, take no heed unto all words that are spoken, lest thou hear thy servant curse thee. For oftentimes also thine own heart knoweth that thou thyself likewise hast cursed others. You see how the Bible knows us? Um, Lady Christine, could you provide a mic for Sister Kim and let her just read that? Or Sister Jasmine and just let them read it for me. Ecclesiastes chapter 7, 21, 24. I very much like how the message puts it. So brethren, we don't always have to go to a person over everything. And some things we can overlook. But there are some things that we cannot suffer with for long without addressing them. I know that. And that is very true. Let's listen to it. This is the message translation. Don't eavesdrop on the conversations of others. What if the gossip's about you and you'd rather not hear it? You've done that a few times, haven't you? Said things behind someone's back you wouldn't say to his face. You've done that a few times too. So what if somebody does it to you? You have done it too. All of us have done it. All of us have done it. You see, that's why I know the Bible is the word of God, you know. Because when you come to the Bible thinking you are going to find out about the Bible, you realize that the Bible knows you. When our brother or sister offends us or is guilty of sin, we have the option of going to him or her directly and dealing with it. Or we can decide to deal with the situation under Christian long-suffering and bearing with one another. We do not, however, have the option of nursing a grudge, allowing bitterness to take root in our hearts, gossip with others, or retaliate. So if you know that that is what is going to happen, go to the person. As C.H. Spurgeon said, we must not let trespass rankle in our bosom by maintaining a sullen silence. Now, may we go and publish the matter abroad. 
we must seek out the offender and tell him his fault as if he were not aware of it, as perhaps he may not be. People have said to me from time to time, Pastor, you pass me on Sunday and you never even greet me. And invariably I will say to the person, you know, I was not aware of it. I'm so sorry. And sometimes I will say, you see, when I'm at church on Sunday, there are so many things that are going through my mind at the same time that it will happen to me from time to time. But if it happens to me, please forgive me. If it happens to me with you, Jesus says, if he, that is the offending brother or sister, listens to you, you have regained your brother. If the offending person listens to you and repents, the discipline process may stop there. You have regained your brother. Our sister, you have regained him or her in two ways. First, the problem has been effectively dealt with. He or she acknowledges his or her sin and asks for forgiveness both from the Lord and you. Perhaps you may discover that he or she was not entirely wrong and that you were not entirely right. Has that ever happened to you? You know how many times it has happened to me with my wife? When I go to confront her and she explains, no me wrong. And me go hot, hot, you know. And then now when she explain, me feel like a dozen dog. But whatever the extent of blame on either side may be, the situation has been resolved. Second, you have regained him or her because you have not wronged your brother or your sister by going to others to spread gossip. In James 5, 19 to 20, James writes, my brothers and sisters, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, he should know that the one who turns a sinner back from his wandering path will save that person's soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Lord willing, we will continue our examination of Matthew 18, 15 to 20. Let's stand, brothers and sisters. So, I want us to do something this evening as we pray and get ready to go. I'd like for us to just find one person maybe two persons, and um, uh, let's, let's, let's pray for each other. Let's ask for God to help us as a body, because this is not something that we do, and Unfortunately, it's perhaps something that not many churches practice. I guess most of us would prefer to spread a little gossip, talk to it with our friends, and then all my friends have off the person, and the person don't know why. You think that can happen in a church? You 
You know where all of this is coming from? Where these lessons that I'm teaching now are coming from? Blessed are the peacemakers, you know. Is there a greater peacemaker than such a person? No. So we want to ask the Lord to help us and to examine our hearts because here at the Grace Workshop we're grappling with hardcore Christianity, the biblical Christianity, not the not the little play play one. And we are finding that we're not doing so well. We're not doing so well. Please, let's just pray for each other. Thank you, brothers and sisters. Now hear me, brethren. Whenever the Lord uses the mirror of his word to show us who we are, he does so because he loves us. He doesn't do so because he dislikes us and wants to give us a fine flogging. He does it so that we can see ourselves and make adjustments. Eh? So don't go away feeling depressed or condemned. Go away saying, Lord, help me. And we should be grateful to God for opening up his word of truth to us. So let's just worship him before we go. And give him thanks. Precious Lord, we thank you. We honor you. Thank you for the work you are doing in our hearts and in our lives. Through your word, because you love us. Thank you, Lord. Open heart surgery continues. You have us on the operating table. You have us in surgery and you're opening up our insides and fixing what needs to be fixed. And we thank you, Lord. We thank you. And this surgery is going to go on until the trumpet sounds. This is a, we're never going to come out of surgery. Thank you, Lord. Brethren, if if you have an offering, please bring it and please greet each other warmly before we vanish away.